them by, gang. <laughs> Stand by, gang. It might happen today. Yes, indeed, it might happen today. All right, all right, can you give me a little echo chamber there? Just a little echo chamber there, Nat. We've got to get them all set here. Already out there? You got your knees already all loose? Easy there? Okay, you're all ready? You got your glove on? How about knocking out some fly balls? You all set, gang? Got your glove all worked up? You got the neat's foot oil all rubbed in there? Is the leather all soft? All right, here we go now. I'll oh, sick. Okay. <coughs> got to clear my throat here. <coughs> all right, all right. Okay, oh, enough echo chamber than that. Not enough echo. I will award you the brass fig gee with bronze oak leaf palm. If you can tell me who and what that theme song was about. All right, Americans, all set now? Do you want to hear it again? Once more, I'll give you just a little touch of it. Now listen carefully. Okay. Okay. Now, who was it? What was it? Oh, come on. Now, what was, what was the product that was about? Now, I'm not, this is not a commercial. Those of you who think I'm giving a commercial, a sneaky, rotten, cheating commercial, no, no, it's not at all. This is one of the great American folk songs. And now, while you're thinking about that great American folk song, I'll give you another clue. It was not the Little Orphan Annie theme song. Okay, gang? It was not the theme song for Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Those are two of the significant clues in this fantastic contest to determine just how good an American you are. Mm. Very good. Very good. You know, have you noticed that I have developed complete control of my instrument? Absolute, total control of this. No, no, serious. Mm. A total, a total kazoo player. <laughs> All right, now, I will give you another one of the great American theme songs that are, di are deeply woven into the warp and the woof of our, of our life. This is, a, this is the kind of thing that makes us what we are. It separates us from the French, the Icelandic tribes. It separates us from all the other peoples of the world because we share things. And these, what is folk music but things? Traditions, ideas, myths, uh, music, stories, all shared by a single people. All right, here's another one. I'll, I'll give you this one now. All set now, gang? Uh... <laughs> that theme song, do you know? You don't. Well, I'm separating the sheep from the goats today, right? I certainly am. Uh, I can even sing the lyrics to that one, which is, a, which is a sad commentary on the kind of mind I've got. I cannot sing night and day. I don't know the choral uh, verses to, I don't know at all the choral work of uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, but I can sing every last word of this great American folk song. Uh, if you'll give me a little echo chamber, I will sing it for you. All right, all right, all set. Have you tried Wheaties? They're all wheat with all of the friends. Who won't you try Wheaties? That comes from every time. All right, all right, all the gang. Now, the name of the man, of course, that this is a theme song about was Jack Armstrong. Jack Armstrong never ties with them, and neither will you. There. All right, you got that? All right, all right, Jack Armstrong. Now, at the end, he, he would sing, the, 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 the trio would sing this now deeply forgettable verse. That uh, that still somehow persists in my garbage type brain. I have I have a brain that that uh, that has, it collects this stuff. You know, uh, it has been said that some people's navels collect lint, others don't. Yeah, oh, it isn't every navel that collects lint. If you think that I'm being, I'm just talk, telling you a medical fact that it is not every navel gnat that collects n lint, and it's not every mind that collects uh, grubbage. That kind of information is just called grubbage. It's not really garbage. It's grubbage. 
Now, <laughs> I will sing to you a thing that persists in my mind. Whenever somebody says to me, sing a song, Shepherd, what do you think I sing? Uh, uh, well, you, you want to know what I sing? All right, I, I sing the theme song of Hudson High. I never went to Hudson High. How did it go? Well, it goes like this. <laughs> because, uh, uh, let's see, how does it go now? Uh, I've forgotten my Hudson High song. Oh, gee whiz, Hudson High. Oh, shake the ball clear around the others. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I remember one line out of my high school song. Purple and white is our hue. The only thing I know, purple and white, isn't that an awful color combination? How would you like to go to a school that its colors were purple and white? Oh, boy. And let me tell you, if there's one thing that purple does, it's, it's uh, fade. And we had a purple curtain in our auditorium that was a purple and white. You know, the purple of our famous school, purple. And well, it had been given to them by the class of 1903, I think. And it was moth-eaten, and the purple had faded. And now it was a light cherise, a little touch of pink in there, and a deep streak of a sort of a somber green. And we would sit there, you know, and they would say, Purple and white is our hue, our victory hue. Oh, Hammond, we'll fight for you. Purple victory is our hue. Oh, man. And I would stand there in the auditorium, and they're all singing the high school pep song, and all I could do was move my mouth. Just the same problem I have when they're singing the Star Spangled Banner. All I know is uh, uh, the banner is, no, how does it go? I don't even remember that one now. Let's see. Oh, say, can you see? That's about it. And then I go, no, 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 da, da, white, uh, purple, da, 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 in the night, da, 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 da. Oh, that's... Uh, you know, it's very difficult for me. Uh, maybe I'm not an anthem type. That could be it. There are certain people who do, uh, who really are. I'll never forget one awful moment that I had in my, uh, in my early... Uh, did, did you hear what I did one time in my early, uh, my early career in radio? Well, for those of you who don't know anything about radio, there is such a man in this racket called a combination man. Now, the combination man, there's several types of combination man. There's the half combination man, there's the full combination man, which I was. Now, the full combination man is a man who has a first-class radio phone ticket. He also is an adept salesman. He's a con man of blinding dimensions. He can run the board. He announces. He operates the, the, the waxer that cleans the floor. He does the whole bit, see, and I was, I was a full-fledged combination man, and one night, I'm, there I am, I'm a one-man radio station, you know, and I've got the transmitter back of me here, and I've got the turntables on both sides of me, and the microphone, and I'm in touch with the world, all by myself, I'm running the whole shebang, and it came to midnight, see, and uh, I finished the newscast, I always finished up with the newscast, and that's the news. Uh, this is WKLNUCK, your happy station, brought to you by the good offices of the, uh, the Happy Broadcasting Corporation. I'm reading this thing, you know. Uh, it's on 1516.SJ7 uh, on your dial, sent to you by the courtesy of the Federal Communications Commission in Washington, D.C. You know, it sounds very official. Here I'm in this little pot boiler. <laughs> I, got, I got this little 250-watt uh, transmitter behind me, you know, with a little electric fan trying to keep the tubes cool. And, and, and just two weeks before that, at, at, at 1 o'clock in the morning when I was running modulation tests on it, tell you about that, man. I'm running modulation tests one night. I'm feeding square waves into this thing. You know, it's all we ever got into it anyway was square waves. It clipped the top off of everything. Even when <laughs> I'm getting very technical here with the crowd. And, and uh, at 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, I'm feeding square waves into this thing, running, running it into a dummy antenna when all of a sudden, Holy smokes, I hear overload relays, you know, going up, and down on the bottom, I see my, there were, there were four 866s down there, you know, the, the half-wave rectifiers. They were lighting up like a neon sign on Times Square. They were bright, oh, wow, they're going, the relays are going out, and then it went, it sat there with smoke coming out of it. Oh, oh, you know, and I could see tomorrow morning, you know, all night I could see myself working on this, this pot boiler, and I got to get on the air, you know, I got to put it on the air at 7 o'clock in the morning with the good wake up morning hour that I did, you know, good morning wake up or good wake up morning, morning good wake. What well, some, you know, thing with the organ music and Bing Crosby and the time and the temperature. There it was, knocked out, and I, I, I opened up the back of the thing, and there, across the turnimals, across, <laughs> was a large mouse. Well, I would tell you, I don't know whether any of you have been in the vicinity of well-cooked mouse. Well, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> you got my broad. So you didn't know about this side of broadcasting, did you, friends? Well, there are other things. I, uh, I'm, I'm signing the transmitter off, and uh, you got the scene there. I'm on one man radio station, and I've. Uh, what I did, you see, I would put on these these half hour uh, transcriptions. We had these big half hour tape, big things, you know, uh, big big glass things. Fifteen, actually, they were sixteen minute, big sixteen minute glass based audio discs. And there were things called, uh, yeah, there were, th were things called uh, organ moods with George Wright at the Mammoth WCKY Wurlitzer Organ. I don't know where they got these old tapes. They kept playing them over and over again. We had a whole stack of these things. They, they had inherited them from a defunct radio station that gave them the Salvation Army, and that was our special program services. They had one program I used to put on every, every so often. Whenever it was, you know, desperate, I had a sore throat, and I, I had to stop talking. Uh, I would put on canary moods. It was a it was a 15 minute program of nothing but canaries warbling, <laughs> and this this oily unctuous announcer was on this on this transcription. He would say, "And now canary moods, the beautiful sound of the Hearts Mountain Canary." The canaries are yelling, and you could hear somebody playing Silver Threads Among the Gold in the background on a pump organ. Da 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 da, and the birds are singing. Well, that was the kind of show, you know, that we specialized in. It had a whole, whole raft of these things. See, so whenever I would put one of these 15-minute shows on, what do you think I would do then? I'd have 15 minutes free. What do you think I'd do? Oh no, no, no! Never sleep. You couldn't sleep when you're a triple combination man. Sleep. What do you mean sleep for crying out loud? No, you know what I would do? No, never clean up. No, 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 no. We never cleaned up the station. It was knee deep in junk, paper cups. No, you never cleaned the station up. You know what I would do? I would immediately slap the turntable head on, on this organ moods or George Wright at the Mammoth, Mammoth console. It would start playing. It would start out with. <laughs> you know how organ shows always sound lousy, you know? They got all that hiss and background noise. And then he would play. <laughs> And the organ is playing, and I am running down the stairs like mad. You see, we're three, we're three stories up. Running like mad down the street. I'm putting on my tie, and I'm straightening my coat. I'm calling on a client. <laughs> I'm about to sell a commercial to Harry's Hardware Store. And I'd get down there, and I'd say, well, uh, Harry, I'd say, uh... I'd like to talk to you, Harry. I understand you're having your big fire sale here. You know, Harry'd come in every couple of weeks with a blowtorch and he'd, you know, singe a few things and he'd have a fire sale. He says, we'd like to, we'd like to run a special. How about, uh, how about running three spots in Bing Sings this week? Had a show called Bing Sings. Guess what it was? <laughs> uh, I'd say, uh, uh, you know, very clever program we had. I'd say, uh, how about, uh, how about let's, uh, three spots in Bing Sings. And while he's waiting, see, I'm watching. I, I know I've only got a minute and a half now before the end of that transcription back up there. You know, I'm hoo-hoo. I said, well, look, Harry, I've got a luncheon date. Whoomp! I'd go shooting out there. I'll call you. Down the street, I'm going, hoo hoo i got 20 seconds. Up the stairs. Here I come, boom, into the studio. And it's just going, ooh. It's going into the cut-in groove, you know. It's, ooh. Ah, you have been listening. You have been listening to George Wright at the Mammoth Transcribe Council. Uh, be sure to stay tuned. I'm trying to think when it's going to be on again. Sometime again soon when uh, George Wright will be at the Mammoth Transcribe Council. Uh, this is your friendly spot on the dial where coal meets iron. In the... <laughs> You know, that little 250-watt, two-bit station break, which goes on for 15 minutes. The longer the station break, the lousier the station. That is a rule of thumb. Uh, the longer the station break, and the wilder the claims that the station makes for itself. The number one spot on your dial, the one, two, three spot. The spot for happiness, friendship, and the sincerity of truly good, dynamic, creative radio, where coal meets iron in the heart of the Lehigh Valley. Yes, where... <laughs> Be careful, that's a bad station. <laughs> You don't want to hear more about this. You know, once in a while I do a show that's totally directed towards the crews in the radio station. <laughs> they're sitting there slapping. each other. Hey, listen to this one, Charlie. Hey, Cliff, I remember one time. You know, they're going like that. And the audience is sitting out there with a big question mark over its head. It doesn't know what's going on here. <laughs> well, you want to hear what I did one night speaking of anthems? Oh, boy. I had just, you know, I had finished the newscast. You got the picture now. I'm in this little one, one-man pot boiler. And, and the only, of course, the only other man was the guy who owned it. 
He owned the station, and he would come in in the middle of, of uh, I'd be doing something. I'd be reading the newscast or whatever it was. And we had one room. Our whole station was in one room. And over in one corner, he had his desk. And he would come in about two and a half hours a day. He would take time off from the golf course. You see, he would come in to see if we're still on the air and we're still making money. And he'd come in and he'd pack all the dough into a bag and go, you know, give me a dirty look, and I wouldn't see him till tomorrow morning at the same time. Well, well, he would come in in the middle of in the middle of my show you know, or commercial. I'm doing or I'm doing a, let's say a newscast. Maybe you people don't know about how great radio can be. Went down on the grassroots, you see, and I had about ten different voices. Have you wondered how I developed all the voices? Well, I had my newscaster's voice. I was, good evening. Yeah, I had a great voice. <clears throat> good evening, Americans everywhere. H.C. Grubbage and the news. It was reported in Washington reliably this afternoon that President Roman, you know, great newscast voice. And then I had my disc jockey voice. I had four disc jockey voices. Uh, I, all, all combination men. You don't want to give the people the idea that one guy is sitting there all day long. He's reading the news. He's doing. That. I had about four different disc jockey voices. And then at noon, if you want to hear what the greatest thing I did at the talk about athletic radio, we were on the third floor. You see, on the main street of this little town in the Midwest. And at noon, right exactly at noon, I would finish this program. Uh, some it was called swing time. Of course, you can see, you imagine what I had. I had just records and stuff, and I had my theme song on. It was it was it was Glenn Miller's Running Wild. Da, da. And I would say, you have been listening to Swing Time. And I'm Stay tuned for Peter Schmidt and the Man on the Street, which follows immediately. Guess who Peter Schmidt was? <laughs> and, and and I had my theme I had my theme on a disc, you see. And the disc would wind out and I'd open up my mic and I would rush to the window and I would lower a mic out the window. The third floor, I would lower it out down the window <laughs> and it would hang down on the sidewalk, about a foot from the sidewalk, and my theme is running out, and I would wait just till the theme runs out. I'd open my mic, I'd run like mad down there, hoping against hope nobody was going to grab the mic and holler some wild thing and say, I'd run down there, and as soon as the tape, the, this came to the end, I would say, and now here is Peter Schmidt down here on the main stem. Yes, we're going to talk to the people on the street to get their views and their news. Let's see where they're going, where they've been. Let's see what they're thinking and what they're doing. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is our first man today. And I would start with my man on the street for a half an hour. I did it. And it was a great... Re <laughs> you don't want to hear more of this, do you, really? Oh, yeah. You want to know how I finished it? How I, how I would finish my man on the street show? Oh, it was a, a very difficult problem. Because, you see, getting it on is one thing. Finishing it is another. I had a switch on the microphone. And this is the way I would finish the whole bit. I, I could throw it off, you see, and I'd say, And now, this is Peter Schmidt down on the street, on the main stem. We've talked to the man on the street. We've talked to the lady on the street. We've listened to their news, and we've listened to their views. And we'll be back tomorrow morning at 12 noon, at high noon, for Peter Schmidt and the man on the street. And I'd go click like that, and then there would be a, just a quiet hum. You know you know how at, at 12.30 or something, there's a little moment of silence on a radio station? I would go... <laughs> Like mad, I go in. I sit down. I'd say, "You have been listening in a totally different voice. You have been listening to Peter Schmidt and Man on the Street, and now we bring you Bing sings." <laughs> And then I would fade it down. I'd say, yes, every day, immediately following Peter Schmidt and Man in the Street, it's time for Bing Sings. <laughs> then I'd say, oh, boy, isn't that Peter Schmidt a gas? Wow. Oh, man. Boy, wait till he gets in there. I want to tell him about that fat lady he had on there. Oh, boy, what a, what a, wow, wow. See, I'm pretending like, you know, that, that there's another guy that when Schmidt comes in, he and I sit around and yell at each other. Oh, boy, isn't that Pete Schmidt something? Oh, man. <laughs> well, someday maybe they'll allow me to do some big show out on the street or something like that and something. Well, in the meantime, this old chef here, and I'll just play with the records a little bit. Now, here's old Bingle, Der Bingle to sing. Uh, uh, <laughs> Now you can see I'm a pro, can't you?
Yeah, you want to hear now how, how that night, that, that terrible, devastating night, you see I'm sitting there at the control room, got it all going. And you know, there's one thing about guys that, that are working a little 250-watt radio station. They're really on top of it, I'll tell you. Uh, you have to be, you know. Uh, he's in total command. I'm, I'm talking about a really a good professional 250-watt combination man. He knows what he's doing. He's got the log and the mic and all that. He's a man at his last, you know. He really is a professional. And, and let me say this about it. Uh, I may sound like it's very funny, but it's a very difficult profession. It's a profession that has thousands of little ins and outs. You have to be extremely flexible. Have, has it ever occurred to you that the best television people, absolutely the best TV people, are all guys who came up through radio? Every last one of them. Jack Parr, Arthur Godfrey, uh, people like Steve Allen. Uh, these were all real, you know, they, you, really, you really get so that you, you're, you're, you're a totally uninhibited performer. You, you've got, you work hard. The first time, I'll never forget the first time I met Ernie Kovacs. Uh, Ernie was working in a little 250-watt radio station, doing everything. News, did you know that what, what the first thing that I, I knew Ernie doing, and I was working at a station across town, this was in Philadelphia. The first, uh, maybe you don't know this, Nat, but Ernie, when I first knew Ernie, was doing a cooking show. And it was a serious one. He wasn't being funny. You immediately laughed. No. Ernie Kovacs would come on with an apron around him with a big chef's hat, and this unctuous announcer would say, And now here is Chef Ernesto with his famous continental recipes. And he would come out and say, Well, hello, folks. How are you? Now, out now. He had a phony accent. He was playing a, 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 a Viennese chef or something. And he'd get his recipes five minutes before he go, We are today going to talk about, uh, we are going to talk about fish Viennese. Now, you take a fish, and he takes this thing, and he does a whole serious cooking show. Well, the thing about working in little 250-watt pot boilers is you have to do that. I would be H.G. Grubbage, famous international news commentator. I would be Peter Schmidt, jazzy man on the street, <laughs> audience man. Oh, yeah. And then I would, be, uh, I would be this guy who was a kind of a definite uh, disc jockey who was always quietly giving you the time and the temperature. And then I would come on. I had my great show. I'd say, it's time now for Livingston Swing Time. And I would, I would be the jazziest, knockout, the, most, the, the wildest disc jockey you ever heard for about an hour and a half. I would change my voice, and I would come on with this kind of routine. Another completely different guy would say, hello, world. Time for a little jazz. And I have this real knockout Muggsy Spaniel record. <laughs> and then for, for the next hour and a half, I would be absolutely cool. <laughs> totally cool. <laughs> then we would pause briefly, and I would say, and now we uh, let's, play, let's just look in on the newsroom. We'll lay in a little lose. Then I would come on. I put on my record of the newsroom, you know, with a, with the ticker tape and the ticker machine going. I'd say, "Hello, everyone. This is the WKLN UCK News Department, bringing you news flashes from here, there, and everywhere around the town." Completely different voice. And and I used to get all kinds of invitations. I'd get invitation for Peter Schmidt to appear at a banquet. I'd be Peter Schmidt. Then I would get invitation for for old cool Jazzbo to appear at a banquet. I'd have my shades on. <laughs> <laughs> they never seem to put the two together, you know. But one night, all right, I'm just to be calm. One night, I am working the station. You got this. You, here's how we all we get back to the anthem business. And I, here I am. I'm cool. I'm on the phone. One thing you must know about 250-watt guys, they're so on top of the scene that they can entertain half the town. They've got it all going. They've got the records going. The mic goes off and on. And they've got the commercials going. They're doing the news and everything else. And at the same time, they have a, 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 a telephone propped up on their ear, sometimes on both ears, carrying on a long-distance running, week-on-end-long phone conversation with a chick. Every 250-watt guy's got a chick going, saying he's all wrong. And she's listening out there on the radio at the same time, saying, oh, it's a wild scene. So, so he, I, I'm sitting there, see, and I got the ear, uh, I, got the, I got the telephone. I said, now, look, baby. I, I said, oh, I said, oh, come down. We've got, a, we've got a Manny's tonight. And, I, and I'm going, oh, yeah, and the record ends saying, uh, that was the New York Philharmonic under Leopold Stokowski playing. Oh, every last 250-watt announcer gets totally conversant with uh, classical music, Jazz, pop music, 
news, anything you name, he's got a really good knowledge of it right now because he has to. You know, it's his whole bit. So I finished. Here, I got the thing propped up. and I'm talking. Oh, okay, baby. Yeah, well, look, I'm signing this. I'm signing this tank off in about ten minutes now. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll down here. I'll, I'll toot. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, that was uh, Leopold Stokowski and the um, no, I just something orchestra. And now the brief news flashes before we conclude today's broadcasting activity. It was reported reliably in Washington today. Well, I finished reading the news, and then I finished reading the sign-off. You know, the thing is brought to you under the aegis of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and I reach over. I now, now listen to that. Now you're going to kill the story here. I reach over. And I throw the switch. I says, and now, our national anthem. And it's going, and I, and I hear the music going. I'm talking to the chick. I says, all right, look, now listen, baby. Now you'll be out in front of the house. Now, yeah, I'll give it to you. Yeah, about, and I'm about, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, okay, I'll see you, baby. Yeah, and I, I hang up the phone, and immediately, <laughs> the phones are ringing. I said, what, 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 what? The phones all around. I have about four phones. You know, all the switchboards lighting up. What, what, what the heck? You know what's going on here at this hour? And the anthem is going. Oh, boy. You'll never guess what I played is the national anthem all the way through. Well, I played. So help me. I played the French national anthem. <laughs> I just signed off, and that was the end of it. The station was off the air, and the calls are coming in. What is this? What is this? What are you doing? What are you putting us on? That's terrible. <laughs> Why don't you go back where you come from? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> all right, friends. You want to hear a real professional radio man at work, huh? Well, uh, that all that reminded me. That all reminded me of this. This uh, I'll tell you the worst little radio station I ever worked. In. You want to hear a real wild little radio station? Well, I I was uh, of course most guys in radio. You might not be aware of this. It's like actors. It's like people who are journalists. Uh, it's uh, radio telegraph operators. There's a certain class of man who. Uh, who really is international in a way. He doesn't have any, any genuine roots in the sense that other men have because of the nature of what he's drawn into, what he is. The, the, the journeyman. Uh, you know, the word journeyman is a good word because it describes most guys who are in that kind of field. They're journeying. They, they're, they're journeying through life. They, they, live, they live in little hotels. They've lived in little towns. They've worked, they've worked uh, practically everywhere at one time or another. And they get a certain... A certain international uh, all-man quality about them because they're not dedicated, let's say, to Indianapolis. They're not an Indianapolis. Ra- they may they pass through there. They've got this little touch of it, and they they're they're in Columbus, Ohio, for a while, and then the next thing you know, they're in Wheeling, West Virginia. They're there for a couple of months, and then they drift on. They're in Washington. Then they drift down to Nashville. Then they're over in, in Miami for a while, and so after a while, the journeyman radio man is like the journeyman. Uh, newspaper man. He's a, he's a, he's a man of all seasons, literally. Well, uh, well, as as part of this scene, you know, you get to know get to know all kinds of things about about various towns. You get you get to know all sorts of accents. You can you can uh, you, you, your your ear rings immediately. You hear an Indianapolis accent. You know what that is. And no matter where you go, you you, you have a skill that nobody else can do. That's one of the reasons why they can journey. You know, most people have a secret desire to travel and live different places, to, to shake the dust of one town and go somewhere else. But few people can do it because they don't have a skill. They don't have, they don't have a talent. Uh, they don't have something that they can go from town to town and sell, peddle easily, quickly, because it's needed, it's wanted. Uh, the, the newspaper man, he's got a skill. He can, he can go from town to town. And once he's gotten enough uh, background, enough... Uh, enough uh, Technique. This guy can work anywhere. A good newspaper man can get a job anytime, uh, anywhere, he, anywhere in the world. He can go to he can go to London and get a job as a newspaper. Because being a newspaper man involves a certain attitude and skill, and he can do it. Well, that's the way with radio. And uh, there are many guys who just drift from town to town, and they see the background and the inside of some wild stations. Shall I ever tell you about the little radio station that exists in the state of Indiana? Strange little radio station that's in a guy's house. It's a, an actual house. The, uh, the, the next room is the kitchen. And, and Mama is always in there cooking dinner. I'm telling you, it's the truth. And you're in there, and you're doing your show. And the show is being done in the living room or the dining room, which they just simply close the door, and that's the studio while they're on the air. The station is only on during the day, and, and the people who work at the station 
due to the fact that the station makes probably uh, it clears cool about a, a cool fifty dollars a week the station clears well obviously they don't pay in money so how they pay is a place to stay for a while <laughs> <laughs> while you're getting your bearings, while you're going somewhere else, you see. And so you work in this radio station, and they let you sleep in the front bedroom. And the upstairs of the house has about five bedrooms. The staff sleeps there, and you eat. They, they feed you, you see. And you get about $10, maybe $5 a week, something like that, so that you can play the scene big, you know, go into town and buy Cokes and walk around and, you know, look, look like you're, you're operating in Salvin. But what you're really getting is a place to live. It's like, uh, you know, it's like, it's like the Bowery of radio operators. Now, now you won't believe this, but all of his equipment is homemade. This guy got his license years ago when, when, uh, when all you had to do was apply for a license. You would be a ham or an amateur or, or an experimenter in the early 1920s, something like that. And he got a license and he held on to it. But he never went any further than that. And he still has his license. You know, what happened is that most of the big radio operators, big radio stations, started out that way. But they grew and grew and grew until finally one day they've got Rockefeller Center all around it, you know, or the gigantic uh, broadcasting house somewhere. But this guy remained exactly what he was. He was a guy who built a little radio station. It was about a 100-watt station. It really was, 100 watt. He had a little antenna sticking out in the back that had wires. Yeah, 100 watts. They had wires hanging out in the back. He had a ZEP feed coming in. And, and he had, I never saw anything in my life like this. He had a set of turntables that had been made many, many years ago that had a long shaft that went down into the basement. And, and the, the shaft came up, and down in the basement was a continuously running motor, and the, the turntables just ran continuously. Two big, fat flywheels that just kept running continuously around you, just ran and ran and ran, and they had wicker stands that looked like uh, fern stands on the bottom of them. It <laughs> just went round and round. You had a feeling that you were working in something that had to do with Al Capone or something. It was very strange, you know. And, and these, these two turntables just went round and round. They had green felt on the top. And the way you would put a record on, you'd lay the record on, you'd spindle it like that, and then you'd just hold it, you see, to keep it from, from spinning. And you hold it like that. And when you wanted to start it, you just took your hand off. Shh, and it went. And then when you wanted to stop it, you laid your hand on it. That was as simple as that. It was a very simple non-wow system. And down in the basement, there's this big motor with a bunch of gears and oil and everything else in the shaft, and it ran continuously. It even ran when the station was off the air. He just kept it running night and day, night and day. The turntable would go. And now the transmitter, now the transmitter, all men who worked there had to have an operator's license, obviously, because he was an engineer, but everybody who operated this rig was operating the station, the transmitter, and everything simultaneously. And back of you, where where in the normal living room or the lo the normal dining room, they would have the the cabinet for the for the uh, crockery and so on. This guy had a little wooden rack and panel, and that was his transmitter. He had a couple of two uh, hundreds, old two hundred ths standing up. They ran about a hundred watts, and here was this little rig there with dust on it. And you'd polish it a little bit, and it had had homemade bus bar wiring and the whole thing. And there he sat down on the low end of the broadcast dial with his own little business going. His own little thing, and he, he'd sell commercials for about a nickel or a dime or a quarter. Whatever he'd get for him, you know, he'd go out and say, he'd come in, he'd have a handful of commercials, and he'd give them to you. you know? And you know that it, the whole handful of commercials, you know, there'd be about ten sheets of paper, represented about a dollar and a half. He just went out and sold them that morning. He'd come back, you know, and he'd have a buck and a half. Now, all, it was all cash, all absolute cash, and it was his own little business. And, and you'd be surprised, people listened to it. It was, a, and that station is still operating today. I, I, uh, I, I don't know whether or not this kind of show has any interest at all to people. Do you think it has, Mike? You think it has? Well, well, one thing that we used to have, in case you're interested, it was kind of a sad thing in a way. Uh, we had a case, uh, a big wooden case on the floor, and the wooden case was divided up into slots. You know, like you put records in it, it was divided up into slots, and it had in these slots. It must have had 250, at least 250, uh, big glass transcriptions of old radio shows that this guy had bought somewhere along the line for about a dollar, maybe a dollar for each one. He could play them as many times as he wanted. They were just old radio shows, and it made his radio station sound like a radio station. And they used to use these to fill in time. That's the truth. And he would put these things on and turn it on and just let it go. And one of them was this show. And, 
And these transcriptions had been played so many times that you could just see through them. You held it up to the light, you know, the groove had been worn through, and they were gray. You know, they all started out black many years ago, and they were gray. They were fuzzy. They had so much dust and stuff on them. And he used to come in, and he'd say to me, he'd say, uh, say, uh, he'd say, how about, uh, uh, it was never programmed, you know, it never had, it never had a program that was published in the paper, like, you know, at one o'clock, swing time, uh, 115, uh, furniture news, 125, uh, uh, newscast, nothing like that. It was programmed by, as we went along, all day long, whatever anyone felt like doing, they put on, you know, that's fun. And so nobody, nobody sat there and says, gee, I can hardly wait for organ moods. I can hardly wait for the canaries to sing. Nothing like that. They just turn it on and you'd go all day long. So he would come in and he'd say, say, uh, I'm, I'm sitting there and there's a record playing. He'd say, how about, uh, he was rummaging through the thing there, the same old records and same old shows we'd played for years on end. And, of course, I only worked there for about two weeks. And he would, uh, I, I really got an insight into a kind of really grassroots radio. He'd say, how about, how about putting this on? He says, we haven't played this for a while. And he takes a big cloth, a big chamois cloth, and he just wipes it off. Woo, woo, woo. He's wiping off this record. He flips it. He blows it, and he's trying to see what the label is. And, and it's Little Orphan Annie or some, some old ancient show, you know. And he used to have shows like, really wild shows, like Between the Bookends. He had a show where I would come up with... We now bring you Ted Wands and Between the Bookends. Shh, it's scratching. And on would come Ted Wands, you see, or whatever his name was. An ancient show he had, just an old thing. He'd say, good afternoon, friends. Wow, and scratching. Good afternoon, friends. And now from that we'll begin this afternoon's program. Shh. From the works of that great poet, that great American poet, Edgar Guest, we, 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 shh, we bring you, it takes a heap of sitting around to make a house a home. And then the organ would go, <laughs> it takes a heap of sitting to make a house a home. <laughs> Well, the little old ladies would call up in tears. <laughs> and they're out there. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you want to hear more about that guy? He'd just have me this thing. And then, it would, of course, I'm sitting there, my ears are buzzing. And he liked it, you know. He'd walk around this old duffer who ran this radio station. It was exactly like that station that they used to have on the radio as a comedy bit. You remember that thing? Uh, who was it who had the little five water down in? Come on, Uncle Who? He had a little five-minute radio show and was broadcast nationally from the National Barn Dance. It's time now for Uncle... He'd say, give a toot on a tooter, Tommy. <coughs> you remember that? Give a toot on a tooter, Tommy. He'd say, this is old Uncle. The little five water down in. And I'd like... And I'd certainly pleasure to hear all you listeners there. Would you please give me a toot on the tooter, Tommy? <coughs> He'd go... He had a little radio station, and his his idea of it was a takeoff on the NBC chime, you know, dum, dum, dum. and he would do, he'd say, give me a toot on the tooter, Tommy, and Tommy goes, dum, dum, dum. he'd say, it's a little five water down in Rosedale coming on, do you remember? A little five water down in Rosedale, what was his name? Why do I remember this stuff? I must have been a year old when that was on. I'm serious. His name was, well, all right now, we'll let you think about that for a minute. And while you're thinking about... Oh, the MC of the show that he appeared on, in case you're really jazzy, was Gene Autry. Gene Autry was the MC, and you'll never guess who was one of the hillbilly singers on it. George Goebel. That's right. Ah, you're learning this. And I was about a year old, and I'm sitting there digging this boy all the way. And while you're thinking of whose radio station that was, the little five water down in Rosedale, I will give you a toot on the tutor, and we'll hear a commercial. <laughs> Okay, you can see that I'm dedicated to radio. <laughs> what a funny medium! And uh, there was another one, another thing he used to do. I were in the, in the same little radio station. In uh, the name of the town that this Indiana station was in, the station is still there. 
And it was kind of a, a legend around there in uh, southern Indiana town, a definite legend. And many of the top radio guys who came on to be real big stars had worked in that little town, had gone through this radio station. Uh, the reason being, uh, you see, he was near to Cincinnati. He was not too far. And Cincinnati was at one time a genuine breeding ground, a real breeding ground for great radio performers. You know who worked in WLW in Cincinnati back in those days? Guys like Red Skelton was a staff man. You know who played the organ on the staff of WLW? Fats Waller. Rosemary and Betty Clooney were there. Oh, the whole scene went on. And, and many of those people had worked in this little pot boiler on their way through. He was a legend there. You want to know who the name of that guy was? How many of you remember Uncle Ezra? It's Uncle Ezra. His little five water down in Rosedale. <laughs> Give him a two down to tutor, Tommy. <laughs> I, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm tempted to do a couple of... You want to hear any more shows about radio? Strange shows. It is a, it is a, a medium that has never been recorded. They've write, written books about the theater. They've written books about the movies. They've written books... No books about radio. None. And I, to me, it's the most romantic of all the mediums. Fantastically romantic medium. I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you some night, sometime when we have time, I'll tell you a story of Fats Waller in the main studio at WLW, playing the giant organ at 3 o'clock in the morning and swilling gin. You could hear him for blocks on end, and the organ people got so mad, they said it's for, for sacred music, that they tried to stop him. You want to hear the rest of that?